So in our last video, we covered multi-tenancy within AuthJS and Next.js, and today we're gonna to be building on top of that by adding role-based access control, which is the ability for an app to permit or deny access to certain resources, pages, and operations based on the user's quote-unquote role. So let's start off by taking a look at a very simple example here. So we have Acme Corp, this organization, and they have three different members. They've got John, Sarah, and Vlad, and all of them have different roles. John, as a user, can only create and read documents. However, Sarah is an admin, so she can create and read documents as well as update and delete them. Finally, we've got the owner role, which Vlad has, and he can perform all actions within the app, including those permissions granted by both the user and admin roles, as well as adding and removing organization members and deleting the entire organization. Now that we have a high level overview of what role-based access control actually is, let's talk about implementation. So first we need to figure out how we're actually defining roles. So there's two main methods we're gonna talk about here. And the first one is just having a single role per user. So this means that for any given member of an organization, they can only assume one role at a time, no more, no less. So for instance, there could be a user role, a moderator role, an admin role, and an owner role. Um, and this is very simple, but it works well for most use cases, honestly. Uh, and typically these roles are going to be hierarchical, meaning that every role that is more privileged than the previous one is going to inherit all of the previous roles permissions and add more on top of it. And as you can see in this flow right here, this is pretty intuitive. The user has the least permissions, the moderator has all of the user's permissions and more, and so on and so forth. Our other option here is having multiple roles per user. So this is when a user can have zero or more roles, right? And that can be up to all of the roles in the app if required. Uh, and this lets you define much more granular permissions for more complex use cases because a role can possibly only encompass a single permission. So we can either specify our roles in plain English, such as you know a developer role, a manager role, billing admin, compliance advisor, and owner. Um, or we can have it be a more permission oriented language where we're kind of defining scopes like user.read or billing.manage or organization.members.delete, right? Uh, and if we take a look at this screenshot from an actual UI, this is from an app called Infysical, you can see that, you know, with this approach, you can have extremely granular permissions when you're adding a user to an organization or creating an access token or something like that. Um, and it's not shown here, but in those drop downs, you can select, you know, create, read, update, delete, and then full access. Now that we understand how we're defining roles, we need to figure out how we're actually going to grant access based on that role. So we're gonna talk about two types again here, and the first one is simply conditioning on the role. This is the most straightforward by far, and it's as simple as an if statement where you check if the user's role is of a certain type. So just as an example, maybe we are allowing a user to update the organization's name, right? But we only want either admins or owners to do that. We can simply just write if the user's role is equal to admin or owner and then execute the logic. This is very straightforward. However, if you suddenly decide that maybe an admin cannot actually change that organization's name, for every single occurrence in your code base where you do that, you need to figure out where that happens and then remove that if statement. So if you understand the business logic of your company very well and you know exactly what each role does, this probably isn't a problem, but as you scale your code base and as you add a lot more you know, logic, access control logic or roles, suddenly any single change to what a role actually can do permission wise might have rippling effects in your code base that you need to address when they change. Our second option here is to condition on the permissions themselves instead of the role. So what does that actually mean? Let's take a look at a scenario here. So let's imagine we're building some sort of app, kind of like Twitter, where a user can make a post and then other users can see it. However, we're gonna add a moderator role and this moderator can edit another user's post if they see there's maybe explicit content or stuff in violation of the terms of use, right? However, a year down the line, our head of product says, you know, this impedes on free speech and we can no longer allow moderators to edit other users' posts. So if we were doing access control based on the permission, all we would have to do is change this mapping between the role and the permission, right? And maybe we have this can function that takes in a role as an argument and then also an operation. And this can function checks this mapping between role and permission. And if we change that mapping, all we have to do is just that. And then the rest of our code is fine. The access control is managed. However, if we're conditioning based on the role itself and we're checking 
is this user's role moderator. Every single occurrence in our code base where we're updating a post, if the user is moderator, we're gonna have to go find that and then change that and remove that You know, if user's role is moderator because maybe now only admins can do that. So the effect of changing a set of permissions for a given a role uh, has a much larger blast radius if you are conditioning on the role instead of the permissions. However, conditioning on permissions is just a lot more complicated and requires way more setup and most people are just gonna go with this simple conditioning on role, which is perfectly fine. However, there is a TypeScript library called Castle.js and it's extremely good at role-based access control in this permissions conditioning way. We're not gonna get into that this video, but we'll go into it you know, more in depth later because it's honestly a great library, but it is very complicated to set up. So how are we gonna be implementing this in next auth? Like last video, we're gonna be using Prisma for our schema. And if we aren't gonna be supporting organizations or multi-tenancy, we can just simply add a role column here to the user model. And maybe it's member, admin and owner, whatever, we're just gonna set the default as member. However, in this video, we are going to be supporting multi-tenancy and we're gonna be building upon the code base that we worked on last episode. So we're gonna add a roll column to this junction table between user and organization. And where do we actually check and enforce this? So whenever we you know, call an endpoint or we're in a server component, we need to first check the organization and ensure the user is a member of that organization. And then based on the business requirement, right? Maybe this is updating organization, for example, here. We're gonna check that user's role. And here, you know, if their role is an admin, we're gonna just throw an error and say, you're not authorized to update this organization. And I have a couple more examples in our repository on how this actually works. So let's just dive into the code. Now, before we get started, just remember npm install. We need to run this Docker build command to set up our Postgres database, Docker run to actually start it. And then we're also gonna to have to push our Prisma schema to that database and now we're set up. Now here is our actual application. This is built on the same code base as last video for multi-tenancy, but I'm just gonna go through it really quick. We can log in here. It's going to allegedly send us an email, but it's actually just in our console right here because I don't wanna actually go through all that work. We have these two organizations here because this is a multi-tenant app. Uh, one organization, we are an admin in it and the other, we're an owner. So let's take a look at the admin organization here. So. We can create an item and all roles are allowed to create this item, right? So we click this and then boom, this is created. And so this is actually adding an item to our database in Prisma, revalidating the path, and then we're fetching that in the server component, which is why that shows up there. Now we have this action which creates a protected item and this will fail because we are checking for a role that just does not exist in our database. So we click this and you'll see you do not have the required role to perform this action, right? And we're just checking if any of the roles that we pass into this higher order function matches our current role. So that's gonna fail. And finally, this will delete the organization and this is owner only. And you'll see that we're an admin here, so we can't actually do that. It's gonna throw that same error. Also, we can protect server you know, components or pages through the same functionality. So if we go to owner only, we get this access denied message. And this is using very similar logic to the server actions, but instead we're rendering a fallback UI instead of the owner approved UI. Just very quickly, we're gonna go into this organization where we're actually the owner, and we can go back to that owner only page, and you'll see that the UI is actually rendered this time. Uh, and also we can go to actions and then delete the organization because we are an owner and boom, it's gone. You'll see we're refreshing the page and actually deleted. Now that we've actually seen the application in action, let's begin with just a quick refresher on what's actually going on in this code base. So this is our schema file. All of these models are provided by next auth besides organization, user organization, and example item. So organization, this is for multi-tenancy, and this is our junction table right here, which allows users to exist within an organization. And here is the crucial part right here. We have this role field and we're just gonna make it a string. You could have it be an enum, but I'm just gonna use a string for now and we have it being user by default. So this app supports three different roles and that's gonna be user, admin, and owner. So apart from the schema file, we've just got a bunch of config right here, not super important. We have our app directory and this is where all of our organization pages are. So this is from our previous code base in the last video I made. If you are a little bit confused, I would definitely recommend checking that out it's on multi-tenancy. We have our next auth root right here. 
And then we have our organizations page where we actually select which organization we're going to auth into. On top of that, we just have components that are used throughout the application. We have our actions here, which there are a lot more this time. So we're going to check out all of them and then some miscellaneous helper functions here in our lib. So we're going to start off by looking at our page where we have all of our actions, where we had the delete organization and then create item as we saw in the demo. So you'll first notice that we have this with auth higher order component. So what does this actually do? If we look inside of it, we pass in children and on error. And in the body, we're going to be retrieving which organization we're currently auth into, and then also checking our auth with next auth. Basic redirects if these don't match. And then we're gonna be making a Prisma query to actually check if this organization exists and if we exist in the organization, right? And you'll notice here that right now we're not actually checking anything role uh, related, right? We're not checking if the user is an admin or an owner or anything like that. We're just checking if the organization exists uh, and then we render the children. And this is something that you may not know, but you can actually pass in an async function if you're in a server component to render children. And within that, you can actually fetch stuff from Prisma. So this is a really cool pattern if you don't know it. We're extracting this user organization and organization that we got from the render method. Uh, and then we're just gonna collect all of these items which we use to render in this actions demo page. So let's take a look at this. Here, very basic styling. Uh, we have these buttons. So we have the create item, the create protected item, and then the delete organization. And then we map our items down here, right? Which is when we created items and then the path is revalidated and then these new items were rendered. All right, now let's check out how we're enforcing role-based access control within these server actions. So if we take a look at the definition here, we have this with action auth function. And here we pass in this roles prop, which is an array of roles. And we get back a object that contains organization as well as some other stuff. So let's take a look at the implementation. So once again, this has a lot of logic that's similar to that with auth higher order component where we check if the user is actually logged in. And then we check if the user is in the organization based on this header that we append in our middleware. So the one difference here is that we also allow roles to equal all. And if it does, that means you can pretty much be any role and we're not going to enforce any sort of access control. Um, otherwise, we know it's an array. And then we check if the user's role exists within this array, meaning are they allowed to actually perform this action? And if they're not, we throw this error, which we saw in our application. And otherwise, we return this object that contains all of our auth and role information. So if this passes, we know what organization we're in. And then we can also get our user if we want, right? And then our session too. Um, and here we just create an example item, which is what we use to to show that the server action works, right? Then we revalidate the path. Here is the create protected item. And here you'll see that we have this role that does not exist. Because if we look at role right here, right? We just have user add and an owner. Um, this role doesn't exist, so this will always fail. And this just demonstrates that the role-based access control actually does work, right? And also here, we could just say all. Um, and that's effectively the same thing as listing all of the roles. Now in the delete organization action, you're gonna see much of the same. We call this with action auth function and we only pass in owner as the role. So if this passes, that means the user is an owner and then we can delete that organization and then just redirect. And finally, we're gonna take a look at this owner only page where we have that fallback UI that we render if the user does not have the correct role. So once again, we're gonna be using this with auth higher order component. Uh, and then we check the user's role based on this returned user organization object, right? So if they are not an owner, we're just gonna show this fallback UI. If they are, we are going to display this allegedly sensitive information here, right? Uh, and obviously this isn't anything sensitive, but if you wanted to, you could, you know, maybe query Prisma, return some information that is gated only for the owner, um, or maybe it's just another dashboard that you don't want most people to be seeing. And of course, this with auth higher order component, you could add a roles field right here, something like that, that matches what we had in the with action auth higher order function um, and enforce that within this body. Or you could just do it here in line. Doesn't really matter. It's more of a stylistic thing uh, just to save some time. So that's just the basics of role based access control in Next.js and Auth.js. I know that I went over the structure of the code base a little bit fast, and that's just because we're using the same code from our previous video. So if you're a little confused, definitely check that out. 
I know we also didn't get to talk about Castle JS and how you can actually condition on permissions. We're definitely going to do that in another video. It's super interesting, but covering that all at once would make a long video, which nobody wants to watch. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.